Okay, if you have your Bibles and your iPhones and your iPads and your telephones, open them all up. You have an outline? Someone asked me last week when we were online, can we get an outline? Of course, you can download your outline. We have them online as well. And so we are going through a series. Um, I try to do it once every 10 years or so. I think I did something similar to this about 10 years ago. And so we're going through a series uh, transitioning from COVID and the different various messages I gave to eventually, in the, probably July, the book of John. That's when we're going to start. But right now we're doing uh, an outreach to Jewish people. It is twofold. In case non-believing Jewish people are watching or out, I want to share with you the scriptures that speak about our Messiah. But it's also trying to equip and educate you on how to do it as well. And so that's why we do this whole series and uh, maybe we can eventually get it downloaded. Maybe we can get someone to put it in a book form and then we can put it in a book and you can make me famous. Anyway, but that, that's just anyone who knows how to do that stuff. But anyway, so the first thing that we talked about weeks ago was uh, what we called a biblical mandate by God on why we should do Jewish outreach. And we said there are basic four reasons that you should share the good news of our Messiah with the Jewish people. One, God is going to bless you for it. Two, it's the command or the pattern of the whole Bible. Share with Jewish people. Three, God is saving our people today. And four, it's our responsibility. We should do it. Then we, we moved over to the how. And the first thing in the how was having the right spirit and the right attitude when you share. Now, for that matter, this would apply to anybody, let alone our Jewish people. But having the right spirit and attitude when you're sharing your faith is, one, we said you should identify with the people you're going to. So we reach out to our Jewish people. We should identify with them, learning their customs, their culture, their history, how they speak. Identify. Second, we said you should be blessing them. In any way that you can, you should bless the Jewish people. Then we said you should love them, seek to have a heart for them like God does. Then we said you should be, did I say praying for them? Praying for them. And finally, you should be willing to sacrifice and do whatever you can for our Jewish people. So there we, we, we did the why and the how, the right spirit. Then we said you need to have the right, uh, do the right verses, biblical verses. This is crucial. And this, I repeat many, many times over, so you get a hold of it. How to use the right verses. And what we started with is the right verses concerning how to present the Messiah in the Old Covenant. And so we dealt with Messianic prophecy. And we dealt with... Uh, if you remember, for a couple of weeks, we dealt with the first thing was his birthplace. We said that it was found in the book of Micah 5.2, Bethlehem. Then we said his nature, the nature of the Messiah. He would be God come in the flesh. And we said, we saw those verses. Isaiah 48, 12 through 16, I think it is. Jeremiah 23, 5 and 6. Isaiah 9, 6 and 7. And Micah 5.2. His nature would be God. Birthplace, nature. Third, we said his unique birth. Isaiah 7, 14, he'd be born of a virgin, an Alma, young woman prepared and ready for marriage. Fourth, we said the time of Messiah, he would come before the destruction of the Jewish temple in 70 CE. And Yeshua came, of course, 30, 40, year, 40 years before that, the, uh, the time of the Messiah. After the time of Messiah, we said we see the rejection of the Messiah. Isaiah chapter 53. Then we saw that the Messiah would die actually by crucifixion. And then the last thing we said about the Messiah is his return. We would recognize him whom they have pierced and we will mourn for him as one mourns for an only son. So a lot of people feel really good. You got those messianic passages down. But you know, I was reading this week or a couple weeks ago in Job. And you know, Job's three friends <clears throat> didn't properly answer Job's problems. And God rebuked his three friends. But there's, there's a, a fourth person that a lot of people are not familiar with, but toward the end of the book of Job, there's a guy named Elihu. And Elihu was young, so he waited till the three friends spoke. And then Elihu spoke, and he spoke right, and he did what was good. And he spoke to Job about God. And so I, I, I like what I'm reading about Elihu. He, re, he, he speaks about God, and we see about two or three, four chapters that he speaks about God. And then when you think he said enough about God, Elihu says to Job, hold on. There's more to be said about God. I haven't touched anything yet. There's more. So, we've dealt with Messianic prophecy, but there's much, much more. 
And so today I want to do a little bit more on Messianic prophecy on verses that are not so common. These are what I call the... Le- is there... Oh, uh, more thoughts on Messiah? Yeah. Uh, th- these, these verses are not the common ones that you normally think of. You might have opportunities to share them. You might not. Uh, but if you're prepared and you've learned about it, then you'll be able to share this. So I think today we just want to make our main idea, or the scriptures point us to the Messiah. All the Old Testament passages did. These will continue to point us to the Messiah so that we can follow him, so we can know and follow him. More verses uh, about the Messiah. So when I like to say, after you've done all that, and I've had chances to share with Jewish people of this, and say, the Messiah, we have to realize, there's a lot of specifics about the Messiah. For today, the first thing we know about the Messiah, he would come, as we see, do we have that? Good. You have your outlines, put it down. Uh, the Messiah would come, actually, from the tribe of Judah. The tribe of Judah. But let me explain a little bit about the tribe of Judah. First, we see, before Judah, we have to go back to Abraham. Of all the peoples of the earth, God chose one. God chose Abraham to be the source of the blessing to the world. Not because Abraham was good, God just made his choice. And God sort of made him, a lot of people say he wasn't the first Jew, Judah would be the first Jew, but we're going to say, We'll say Abraham was the first Jewish person. And he pulled him out of the nations, and he said, from Abraham is going to come the blessing to the world. And God is focusing. What he's doing in Genesis, he's narrowing the field to focus on the Messiah. Who is the Messiah? And so we see the Messiah first, and, and we share this, I have shared this with Jewish people, the Messiah had to come first from Abraham. We see Genesis chapter 12. Now the Lord said to Abram, when he called him, he says, go forth from your country, from your relatives, from your uh, father's house. God called him. He was in, near Babylon, Ur of the Chaldeans. God called him out of his pagan family. God called him, and he went up to near Syria, and then he finally came down to Israel. And God spoke to him and says, go from your house, your father's house. Go to the land I will show you. I always like that because I always feel like God, Abraham said to God, where? And I don't know if Abraham said where, because if he did say where, God would have answered him back. I'll tell you where, but I'm not telling you now. Go. Well, which way should I walk? Go. Just walk. And God directed Abraham to the land of Israel. And it says, to the land which I will show you. Uh, God says to him then, when you go there, I will make you a great nation. All nations will come from Abraham. Many. Jewish, non-Jewish, Jewish people, Arab people, many, many nations would come from Abraham. And Abraham, I'm going to bless you. God's special hand, a blessing is going to be on him. Nations are going to come from you. I'm going to prosper the world through you. The blessing of Abraham, you see, what God is doing is, he's saying, through Abraham, I'm going to bless the world. You are my, my special instrument. In application to all of us, you have to understand, God has made you a special instrument to bless the world as well. God blesses us, and we are called to bless other people. But here, God is going to bless Abraham. And it says, I will bless you. I'm going to make your name great, Abraham. And uh, so you're going to be a blessing to the whole world. The blessings of God are going to come, and specifically the blessing of Messiah would come through Abraham. I will bless those who bless you. I will curse those who curse you. And in you, all the families of the earth will be blessed. He goes on, Genesis chapter 17, speaking to Abraham. God says, I will establish my covenant between me and you. I will multiply you, Abraham, exceedingly. This is very interesting because, well, at this point he had had Ishmael already, but God promises there's going to be a Jewish seed. And he says, I will make you exceedingly fruitful. I will make nations of you, and kings will come forth from you. God said to Abraham, in a sense, I'm going to bless you and bless the world. And God is going to do three things, at least three things through Abraham. One, he's going to bless Abraham by giving him a special uh, land. And we see that's traced throughout Genesis. And I'm going to give you a, a land, a prosperity in a land, and I'm going to give you a seed. And that's going to be the Messiah. So he goes on to say here, uh, I will establish my covenant between me and you and your descendants after you uh, throughout their generations for an everlasting covenant to be God to you and your descendants after you. And I will give to you and your descendants after you the land of your sojournings. That's God's promise to give the nation of Israel to the land to the Jewish people. All the land of Canaan for an everlasting possession, and I will be their God. God has a special blessing 
for Abraham and his descendants. Now, I could hear someone saying, wait a second, what about Ishmael? God, Abraham had Ishmael. And God says to Ishmael and to Abraham, I have some blessings for him. I will bless the Arab people. I will bless Ishmael. But what I'm talking about, the land, the seed, the blessing, I'm working through you, Abraham. The way I'm going to bless the world is through you, Abraham. Well, is it Ishmael? No. And God, uh, Abraham had Ishmael. Actually, Abraham had many sons. But he had Ishmael, but then he had Isaac. The blessing of Abraham was to come through Isaac. We continue in the book of Genesis 17, verse 18. And Abraham said to God, Oh, that Ishmael might be... Abraham may have doubted that God was going to give him another son. And he says, Oh, that uh, Ishmael would live before you, Lord. But God said, No. Sarah, your wife, will bear a son to you. And you will call his name Isaac. And I will establish my covenant with him for an everlasting covenant for his descendants after him. That's interesting because Abraham is now almost 99. Sarah is 89. And Abraham says to God, I'm old, no more children, so your blessing will come through Isaac. God says, no. Next year, and I can picture Abraham, 99. Huh? Next year, another child? He said, I'm going to bless you, Abraham, with another child. It's through him I'm going to bless the world. And when I'm talking blessing, I mean specifically, there's others, there's land, but the seed, that's what God said, the real blessing of Abraham. And it says, my covenant I will establish with your son Isaac, not Ishmael, whom Sarah will bear to you at this season next year. We go on, he says to Isaac, uh, to, uh, Isaac again, concerning Isaac. <clears throat> uh, Sojourn in a lamb, Isaac, and I will be with you and I will bless you. For to you and your descendants I will give all these lands, language is similar to what he has promised Abraham, and I will establish the oath, the blessing, which I swore to your father Abraham. There's a special blessing. That's the Messiah. It's going to come from Abraham. From Abraham, it's going to be the blessing to the world. Your father Abraham, I will multiply your descendants as the stars of heaven. I will give them the descendants, all these lands, and by your descendants, all the nations of the earth shall be blessed. That's the blessing of Abraham. Three things you always remember of the blessing of Abraham. A land, a seed, and blessings to the world. That's what he's going to do through Abraham, through Isaac. And God is focused. It's almost like a, a funnel. He's focusing it down to one throughout the whole book. But Isaac, he had a couple sons too. And he had Jacob and Esau. And I hear people, you know, people who are not positive to the Jewish people. Well, maybe God's going to bless Esau. It's amazing. Because if you trace it in Genesis, and especially Deuteronomy, God says, I'm going to bless Esau. I'm going to give him a lamb. I'm going to do something special through Esau. Through Esau. But the promise, the blessing of Abraham, land, seed, and blessing, I give to Abraham, Isaac, and now his son, Jacob. Not Esau. Esau has his other blessings. We see Jacob continues the blessing. And when I say the blessing, I'm focusing on the eventual seed, the Messiah. He says to Jacob in chapter 28, So Isaac called Jacob and blessed him. And uh, charged him and said to him, You shall not take a wife from the daughters of Canaan in the land of Israel, the Canaanites. You know all the ites. There was the, uh, I, I try to get through the alphabet, you know, the Jebusites, the Canaanites, uh, help me, the Gergesites, the Hittites, the Hivites, the Perizzites. The, what's that? Hivites, good. There's always all kinds of ites. Anyway, but they're in the land, in the, and this this was a, a cursed people in the land of Israel. And God had said to his Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, do not take a wife from the ites. They're, they will bring you away from me. But go back to my father's house. And so uh, he says, don't take them from Canaan. May God Almighty bless you, Jacob, and make you fruitful and multiply, that you become a company of people through Jacob. May he also give you, everyone, the blessing of Abraham, right. That's a special blessing. Blessing of Abraham. It's to come through Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And so God developing it through Moses and, and reaching, telling us about the blessing of Abraham. Uh, verse, where was I? Yeah. Genesis 28, 13. And behold, the Lord stood above, above it. Another vision he had in chapter 28. And he said, I am the Lord, the God of your father Abraham, the God of Isaac, the land on which you're lying down. 
that would be Jacob. He was leaving the land of Israel, fleeing from his brother. He was lying on the land of Israel, and he was going to flee to Haran, to Laban. And as he's lying on the ground, God speaks to Jacob, young man, as he's fleeing from his brother. And God says to you, Jacob, I'm going to bring you back. You're going to Haran. I'm bringing you back to this land. The land that you're lying on, I give to you because this is the land that I promised Abraham, Isaac, and now you, the blessing of Abraham. So he was lying there, wondering about the future probably, and he says, I will give it to you and your descendants. And your descendants also will be like the dust of the earth. You will spread out to the west and the east and the north and the south. Your children, children of Abraham, Isaac, and now Jacob. You know? And, and when you, I say that, I want you to get the feel, because this is the feel in Genesis, that there's God out of the world, God picked Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. And Jacob would spread out and have many, many children. And God would focus on one of his children to be the source of blessing to the whole world. That's the coming Messiah. That's the seed of the Messiah. But we don't know that yet. We know it because we look back. But then they didn't, and he was promising this blessing to them. Genesis 35, um, Jacob's come back from the land of uh, Haran is near Syria, and he comes back, and then it says, Then God appeared to Ab uh, Jacob again when he came from Padan Aram, up near Syria, and he blessed him. And God said to him, Your name is Jacob. You shall no longer be called Jacob. I'm changing your name to Israel, Prince with God, Prince of God. So your name shall be. So thus he will call him Israel. So throughout the Bible, when you see the word Jacob and Israel, they're almost synonymous. Jacob represents all of Israel. Many times later, the prophets are speaking to the nation of Israel, and you know what he said to them? Oh, you children of Jacob. It means all the children of Israel. Jacob's long gone by the time he's speaking about all the Jewish people. And so he says, uh, you're going to be called Israel. That's why some people say Jacob is the first Jewish person. I like to think Abraham really was the... Abraham is unique. He was a Gentile and he was a Jew. Nobody else was like that. Isaac, only Abraham could produce Jewish and Gentile people. Abraham produced Isaac, Jewish, and uh, Ishmael, not Ishmael, uh, Esau, Gentile. It was strange at the beginning. Don't ask me about the specifics. Too bad, that's it. Okay. Um, and then Jacob would be Jewish and all his children. And he says, well, yeah, um, your name is, will be Israel. God said to him now, I am God Almighty. Be fruitful and multiply, Jacob. A nation and a company of nations are going to come from you. Kings shall come forth for you, from you. The land which I gave to Abraham and I gave to Isaac, I give it to you now. And I, will, and, and I will give the land of your descendants after you. So now God made a promise to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Jacob had 12 sons. Now where is the seed, where is the blessing, the promise going to come of his 12 sons? Because you have to have a Messiah come from one of those 12 sons. And so Jacob had what we know as the 12 tribes of Israel. And so from one of those tribes, so you see how God is blessing it? He's taking from Abraham, then he's focusing on Isaac, then he's focusing on Jacob. Jacob causes problems, not problems, but he has 12 children. Which of the 12 does the Messiah, the blessing, go through? Of course it goes through the whole nation, but there's one that it's got to focus on. One of the 12 tribes. Now you all know the 12 tribes, don't you? You do? You know how to, you all memorize them, you know them. You want to come up here, anyone try to say them? So, Twelve tribes of Israel. You all know it. But, and I, I love to do this. I've done it before. I'll, I'll do it again for you. Anyway, this is how you remember the 12 tribes of Israel. Okay? Some of the, my method falls apart, but that's okay. Um, I happen to have read the Bible a number of times, so the first four stick in my head. Because I remember uh, Jacob's wife, uh, Rachel, couldn't have children, so Leah had children. So I, by some chance... I memorized the first four. Now already you're telling me, I don't like that. I already have to memorize. Yeah, you have to memorize the first four. The first four, everyone knows the first one was Reuben. Everyone? Reuben. Uh, I'm not sure if that means God sees or God hears. I'm not sure which one it is. But first one was Reuben. Um, so he had Reuben. Reuben did wrong, took his father's concubine, and God took the blessing away from Reuben. The second of his children, well, does anyone know? Shimon, good, Simeon, right. Okay, one means God hears, one means God sees. I forget which is which. Anyway, so you have to memorize these first three. So Leah was very happy. She had first, she had Reuben, and she said, now my husband will love me, not love Rachel. Uh, so then he still loved Rachel, so then she had, God gave her another son, and that was Simeon. And now she's, ah, 
My, my husband, Jacob, he'll love me now, and he won't love Rachel because I've had two children for him, and Rachel's had none. So now it's, everyone say the two, first two. Good. Now he's had, we've had two children, Reuben and Simeon. Uh, and so, but he still loves Rachel. And then God blessed her again, believe it or not, with a third child. Gee, I'm so thrilled. My husband's going to love me for sure now. He's going to reject Rachel because I've had a third son. Does anyone know the third son? Levi. Very good. Okay, you just got to get these four, first four, then I'll give you some tricks. Anyway, first one was, second one, third one, Levi. Good. Okay, so now she thought for sure that uh, he'll, he'll pay no attention to Rachel and he'll love me. Nope, not yet. And God still uh, favored Leah and gave her a fourth son. Does anyone know the name of the fourth son? Judah. Okay, good. So now we know the first four sons. Now I'll try to help you with the others. But anyway, you have to learn the four, first four. Everyone, first one. Okay, now you say, I'll never get eight more. Yeah, okay, let's, let's try to get eight more, okay? This, uh-oh, trouble? Okay, this, uh, this is where we have to try some memory devices. Uh, what I do, you might not like what I do, but this is what I do. I say, uh-oh, there's a problem. Okay, we don't know what's going on. Everyone who's watching in TV land, okay, okay. Anything, we all set up there? Click, click, good. All right, everyone, Reuben, Simeon, Levi, Judah. Okay, now you go to the first letter of the alphabet. What is that? A. Does anyone know any tribe within the letter A starting it? Asher, even if you don't know too much, you know A, Asher. So now you know, fine. The first is Now you go to the first letter of the alphabet, so then you go to the last letter of the alphabet, which is Zebulon. So now, you, believe it or not, you know six already. You know Reuben, Simeon, Levi, Judah, Asher, Zebulon. Now I'm stuck. You'll never get me there. I think there's another tribe that only has three letters. Oh, yeah. There's two tribes that only have three letters. Anyone know what they are? Gad and Dan. Dan or Gad, whatever you want. Now you're up to eight. You can do this. Everyone, let's... Give me eight tribes of Israel, all of you, together. Boy, we're set. We're, I'd be happy with eight of them, okay? Let's try the next two. Next two are a little harder. Next two are a little harder. I take a very, very Jewish name. One of the very, very Jewish names that I could think of is Izzy. That's a very, when you think of a Jew, you can think of, my wife and I talk about my, my cousin, he's Stanley Shoemaker. You ever, that's a Jewish name, Stanley Shoemaker. Stanley, Stanley's a good name, Morris. But when I think of a Jewish name, I think of Izzy. So Izzy one day, he got tired of walking around, so he decided to buy a car. Ah, like that one, okay? Now you know another tribe of Israel, and his name is? Izzy, Izzy had a car. Is he had a car? So what are we up to nine? Okay, is he had a car? Then Izzy got tired of driving around so long and so far, so he decided to take a nap and lie down. Nap to lie down. Nap to lie. Nap to lie is a tribe. So now you got ten. Izzy had a car and he took a nap to lie down. So now we know ten. Can you say ten? A. Boy, you're going to leave here today. You're going to know the 12 tribes of Israel. The last two you should know automatically. Joseph is his favorite, the coat of many colors. Right? Joseph, and then the baby of the tribe, of the family, Benjamin. There's your 12. Here we go. Anyway, you know the 12 tribes of Israel. Of the 12 tribes of Israel, God said they're going to be God's witness and testimony to the world, but of one of those, the Messiah is going to come from. He's going to be the ruler in Israel. The Messiah is going to come from the tribe of Judah. God tells us that. Moses tells us that. And we see that in uh, uh, Genesis 49. We've looked at this in the prophecy before, but Genesis 49 says, Then Jacob summoned his 12 sons, as Jacob was about to die at the end of the book of Genesis, he gave a blessing to his 12 sons, and he comes to Judah. Well, it says, 
Then Jacob summoned his sons and said, Assemble yourselves that I may tell you what will befall you in the days to come. Judah. Now, already, because you see that's verse 8, he already dealt with Reuben, Simeon, Levi, and now Judah. And he's given a blessing for each son. And now he gets to Judah, the eighth one, and he says, Judah, here's the blessing that's going to come to you in the future. Judah, your brothers, they will all praise you. All 11 tribes are going to look up to Judah. They'll praise you. Your hand shall be on the neck of your enemies. Well, that's the king. The king, the ruler of all the 12 tribes will come from Judah. Judah's going to protect all the people from their enemies. Judah's going to lead them, the tribe of Judah, summoned from the tribe of Judah. It says, your father's sons shall bow down to you. See, God is elevating Judah right now. He's making the name Judah means praise. And so from, from all the, as God's focusing, and that's what Moses is doing now in Genesis, he's saying the blessings are all going to culminate in the tribe of Judah, in one of the sons of Judah. And he says, Judah, uh, Judah, you're a lion's whelp. Picture of a lion, the king. From the prey, my son, you, sh- you have gone up. You will couch down. He lies down as a lion. He's comparing the head of Judah with a lion. The leader of Judah as a lion. That's the picture of a king. And as a lion, who will dare rouse your leadership, your king? The scepter of the king, the ruling rod. The scepter will not depart from Judah. Judah will rule. It will not depart. Judah's king. Now we know from the tribe of Judah and the land of Judah, uh, the kings of Israel came from Judah. And we see, starting with uh, not the first one, Saul, he was, but then after David, it was through Judah. It would be David, and then it would be Solomon, and then I'm not going to name them all, I'm not going to tell you how to name them all, but I know Rehoboam, and then I know some of the others, okay? Uh, I, I didn't memorize them. There would be Asaph, and there would be Jehoshaphat, and there would be Josiah, all sons of David, all sons of Judah, the ruler. The kings that came from King David were a picture of the ultimate king of Israel. The kings of Israel would rule, but all fall short. They were almost the writers of Samuel and Kings and Chronicles. They write about all the kings, but in such a sense to show these kings failed. We are all looking for the son of David, the king that will rule over everyone. And uh, Moses is telling us here that he would come from the tribe of Judah. That They were all pointed to Messiah. And it says, the scepter will not depart from Judah. You'll always have a king there until, the phrase there means that Judah will always have a son until something goes wrong. And something will go wrong. We know that. In 70 CE, it went wrong. The Romans came in, destroyed the people, destroyed the temple, destroyed the land, and you know, in a sense, the line was broken. But God, not in God's eyes. Because God would always produce, make sure the Messiah came from the son of David. And it says, the scepter will not depart from Judah, nor will the ruler's staff, his ruling rod from the king, leave his, between his feet until Shiloh. We got up there, I told you that last time. Is there Shiloh up there? Yeah, Shiloh. That word Shiloh is uh, sort of an acrostic that, tries to, that really means he whose right it is to rule. Now, this is just not a messianic understanding. Jewish people would say Shiloh is another way of saying Messiah, the one who is yet to come. And so the word Messiah, it's used in the book of Ezekiel as well, meaning the one who's right it is to rule. The one who's right is the Messiah. And he's saying here, the scepter won't depart until the Messiah comes. And to him, this one, uh, shall be the obedience of all the people. The Messiah will come. The scepter will not depart until Messiah comes. It's interesting, isn't it? The scepter departed. Anyone know when? Anyone? Have an idea? Nobody? Okay. Okay. 70 CE, temple was destroyed. All the records were destroyed. There was no more. Jewish people were scattered. The scepter, the ruling rod, was gone. Messiah had come 30 years before that. And Messiah would come. Then there would be, the temple would be destroyed. Messiah is coming back. He will rule. But here it's telling us he will come before um, the destruction of the Jewish temple. The first thing, aside from his birth, his uh, nature, his birthplace, uh, his uh, unique birth, uh, his time, uh, his rejection, his death, his return, 
I have had this chance to share, the Messiah would have to come from the line of everyone, Abraham. That's a requirement for the Messiah, right? He had to come from the tribe of Judah. And so it's always funny because when you talk to Jewish people all over the world, they all know which tribe they're from. Did you know that? Everyone. All the Jewish people throughout the world. I don't know how they know, but they all know. All my Jewish friends, everybody, all come from the same tribe. Did you know that? I never heard a Jewish person tell me he came from the tribe of Naphtali. I've never. I've never heard anyone tell me they come from the tribe of Issachar. They just never said that. All the Jewish people come from what tribe? Levi. I don't know why they pick Levi. They all want to be a Levite. But the Bible says the blessings are going to come for all the Jewish people, but through Judah specifically. Judah. No one ever says they come from the tribe. I personally would probably prefer to come from the tribe. I don't know. Nobody knows. So when people tell you they're from the tribe of Levi, you know what you do? Go, oh, that's nice. That's nice. That's nice. That's nice. Very good. I'm glad. Good. 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 You have a good time being from the tribe? I'm happy for you. Anyway, so everyone's from the tribe of the... You just answer them back. To, well, I'm from the tribe from the king. No, the king, which was the side. Anyway, that's aside from anything. First, first thing about today, it's strange verses, but you talk about Messiah. He'd come from the tribe, from Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and from the tribe of Judah. Okay, second thing, just, I, I, I like this, I think we might just stop it today too. The second thing about this would be the Messiah would be like Moses. Now this is an important concept in the Bible, even though it's not the common thing you talk about with Jewish people, but it is something to strengthen our faith and show us Messiah would not only come from Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and Judah, but he'd be a prophet like Moses. Well, I hear people say, well, there's a lot of prophets, you know, so what? He'd be just another ordinary prophet? No. Uh, God is speaking in the, uh, in the book of Deuteronomy through Moses. And I want you to get the picture back. We're not going to turn to it. In Exodus chapter 19, Jewish people all come to the foot of the mountain, Mount Sinai. And God is up there. And there's thunder and lightning and flashes and rumblings. And the whole earth is shaking. And God had told Moses and told the Jewish people, I will meet with you on Mount Sinai. That would be nice. You're the people of God. You're the Jewish people. I'd like to meet with God. We'll show how special I... Well, when they came there in Exodus chapter 19, it says the people were there with fear and trembling. It was so awesome and so fearful. They thought they would all die. Clouds to clouds and lightning and flashes and the rumblings of the earth. And they thought they would die. And in Exodus 19, they say to Moses, we can't meet with him. He's too awesome. He's too powerful. He's too mighty. We are scared to death. We are Moses, you. You represent us, Moses. You go up to God. Hear from him. Tell us what he says. We'll do whatever he says. And that's really the picture in Exodus 19. The people said to Moses, we, we're too fear with fear. Even Moses, it tells us, was with fear and trembling. Moses would have to go before God. And in Exodus 19, we see Moses went up the mountain. And God spoke to him and he came back. And he spoke to the people. Now get the picture here. God spoke, wanted to speak to the people. He took a representative of the people, one pro person. He spoke to Moses, and Moses spoke to the people. Now that's the idea here. Now I want you to understand the difference, because I've said this many times, the difference between a prophet and a priest. The difference between, main difference between a prophet and a priest, best way I could describe it is this way. You picture a big clock, and at the top of the clock is the number 12, you go down, one, two, then three would be on your right, six is on the bottom, nine is on the left, and 12 up top. Now picture, um, God is number 12. The people are number six. The prophet is number three. The priest is number nine. Now, this is just Larry's made-up story, but, but it tells you what the difference between a prophet and a priest are. God never spoke to the people directly. He always used an intermediary. God always did. The greatest intermediary yeah. in the Bible is Yeshua. In fact, in John chapter 1, uh, which we'll look at, when God wanted to explain himself to the people, you know what it says? He became a man and became Yeshua. Yeshua is the way God speaks to the world. But Yeshua speaks through prophets. So picture this. God's message to the world, number six, comes through the prophets. 
Number three, God speaks to the prophets. The prophet speaks to the, uh, to the people. God speaks to the prophet. The prophet gives God's words to the people. That's how God has always spoken to his people, through the prophets. The difference with the priest, he's not a prophet. The priest is here. He represents the people to God. He takes the sins and the weakness and the illness and infirmities of the people and he takes their prayers and he goes to God. So that's the difference. The priest represents the people to God. The prophet represents God to the people. And so God's message always came through a prophet. Now, in, in Exodus 19, God says, I'm going to speak to the people uh, but with fear and trust, through Moses. Now we get 40 years later, they're in the wilderness, and God is speaking to the people. And he refers back to Mount Sinai. But here he says this. In verse, uh, uh, chapter, Deuteronomy, the prophecy is, Deuteronomy 18, verse 15. The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among you. Now this is just not, you and me speaking, so you say, this one's like so-and-so. God says, I'm raising up someone, a representative, to speak to you like Moses. This one is going to be like Moses. This will not be an ordinary prophet. He'll be the prophet of all prophets. He will speak to the people for God. He will be like you, Moses. You're Moses, you're, Moses is elevated here. And it says, I'm going to raise up a prophet from among you, from your countrymen. You will listen to this prophet. This is in accordance with all that you asked for. See what I was mentioning? Of the Lord your God at Horeb, that's Mount Sinai, on the day of the assembly, saying, let me not hear again the voice of the Lord. I can't hear the voice of God. They were scared. My God, let me not see this great fire anymore, or I will die. The Lord said to me, they have spoken well. Okay, I will speak through you, Moses. And then Moses says in chapter 18, verse 18, I will raise up uh, a prophet from among their countrymen. Now, we know a lot of prophets. We know Elijah and Elisha. We, we know, uh, who, what other prophets? Oh, Hosea, Joel, Amos, Obadiah, Jonah, Michael. We know a lot of the prophets. There's always prophets. The school of the prophets. A lot of prophets. Are these prophets like Moses? Well, maybe. Yeah, a little bit. They speak to the people for God. But I think Moses is going beyond them. And he says, I'm going to raise up a prophet uh, uh, from your countrymen. I'm going to put my words in his mouth. He will speak to them all that I command him, this prophet, this unique prophet. It shall come about that whoever will not listen to my words, which he will speak in my name, I myself will require it of him. This passage, I don't know if we get it yet, but you will in a minute, but that this prophet is not an ordinary prophet. This prophet is something unique and different. He is like Moses. Well, how is Moses different than all the other prophets? We'll see in a minute. I want you to look at the end of the book of Deuteronomy. Moses, give me, give you the context. Moses is about to die. He's been with the people. He was 40 years in Egypt. He was 40 years in the wilderness. Moses uh, took them to the, uh, up to the other side of the Jordan, the other side of the Jordan, before they went into Israel. Moses is giving messages in Deuteronomy, about three messages. He's preaching messages to the people. Now I'm going to die, and he's giving them these messages. And so at the end of Deuteronomy chapter 34, we know Moses died at that chapter. And look what it says. So Moses, the servant of the Lord, died there in the land of Moab. Now, land of Moab, the other side of Israel, over the Jordan, up in the mountains there. Moses died there. Now let me ask you this verse. Let me ask you. Uh, it said, where was it? He died there in the land of Moab. Who wrote that? We don't think about that. Did Moses write about his own death? He could have. He could have. I used to believe that. He could have. It says, the servant of the Lord, Moses, died there in the land of Moab. I don't think it was Moses who wrote that. Um, it might shake up some of your faith, but I don't think Moses thinks, so I died? I'm going to die? I don't know, should I write it before or after I die? I don't know. So I don't think Moses wrote it. So the question is, who wrote it? My first, uh, come to my mind, my first thought, Joshua. Makes sense. You know, Joshua continues the law. He writes the book of Joshua. So maybe it's Joshua or somebody else. I don't know. But someone other than Moses, I believe, wrote it. And so it says, so uh, he died in the land of Moab according to the word of the Lord. And he, probably God, 
he buried him in the valley in the land of Moab. Whoever's writing it, it says he, it might be God, who buried Moses in that land. In the, in the opposite Beth Peor. But nobody knows the burial place to this day. Let me tell you something. I believe Joshua knew where Moses died and where God buried him, in the general vicinity. Whoever wrote this, Moses died, and we don't know where he is. We have no clue. We know it's somewhere up there. If it was Joshua, maybe, but he didn't know where God hit him and Moses. I don't know. Now, there's a concept that people don't like, but probably, probably the Old Testament, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, Joshua, Judges, the whole, the whole thing, that was not a complete book until a long time later. There were bits and pieces. Isaiah wrote his book. Jeremiah wrote his book. Ezekiel wrote his book. Maybe Ruth wrote her. Maybe Samuel may have written the first and second Samuel. But there are pieces all over. When did it come together to become the official word of God? Now, as soon as it was said and spoke by the people, it was God's word. But it's out there. God used someone to put it all together and solidify the whole thing. And it makes sense. Many Jewish scholars, Christian scholars, many people believe the one who put it all together would be the end after Israel was taken captive to Babylon, after Israel came back, after um, uh, Ezra and Nehemiah and uh, the Jewish people were back in the land. Um, and then there's the, uh, the time where the Jewish Sanhedrin takes over, about 400 B.C. There was one Jewish leader. We have a book of his. One Jewish leader who was a scribe, who put it all together. He was the head of the Sanhedrin, head of all the Jewish leaders. We know from the history. We know from his book. And that's probably Ezra the prophet, Ezra the scribe. Ezra probably what we like to think, collated the whole Old Testament and brought it together. I believe God used Ezra to be the editor of the Old Testament. He put it all together. And the amazing thing is, watch this, if Ezra's the editor and he puts it all together, he's adding something, not to God's word, but he's at, and God inspired him, he's adding something to the whole Old Testament here. And his, in his book, but I think he added something to Deuteronomy here. And this is what he says, if it's him writing. And it says, uh, he buried him, since that day, there's no prophet that's risen in Israel like Moses. Wait a second, if Joshua is writing it, he's saying, since Moses died last week, there's never been a prophet to rise up like Moses? That doesn't make too much sense. But most sense makes, most people believe, that Ezra did it. And at the end, and he put it all together, and he did what we like to call inspired editing. God inspired Ezra to put it all together. And the amazing thing is about, Ezra lived about 440 B.C.E. Moses lived about 1440 B.C.E., a thousand years before. And Ezra is telling us, throughout the history of Israel, Moses and everybody... We're still looking for the prophet. No one has risen like Moses. I just said to Ezra, whoa, what about Elijah and Elijah? What about Isaiah? What about Jeremiah? He's saying 440, a thousand years later, we're still looking for the prophet. That's amazing. And he's saying no one's risen. Ezra's still asking. Uh, and the Jewish people, where's the prophet? 400 years later, there was a man in the wilderness named John. And they said, to, they said to him, to John, are you the prophet? They're still the Jewish people. Now it's 1440. Uh, it's 1440 years after Moses. 400 years later after Ezra. I'm confusing everyone. Anyway, so all the Jewish people in the time of Yeshua and, and John, Yochanan the Immerser, said, John, we've been looking for the prophet like Moses, Genesis 18. Are you the prophet? You know what John's answer was, anyone? No. I'm not the prophet. No, I'm not. We're still looking for the prophet. John's thrown in jail. John sends his disciples to Yeshua. He says to Yeshua, are you the prophet that was to come? Yeshua is the prophet. Moses' great prediction. But how was, getting back to the whole, I knew I'd get stuck here. Uh, how was Yeshua like 
Moses. Well, a lot of people say, let me see, do I, before I tell you how I think. Yeah, okay. Um, yeah. Well, I'll give you a clue here. Look at the end of that verse. Verse uh, 10. Since that time, no, Moses, no prophet has risen in, uh, like Moses in Israel who knew the Lord how? No prophet ever went up to Mount Sinai and saw God face to face. No prophet spoke directly to God face to face. They couldn't. And that's what I think the similarity is. Like Moses. Moses came down. He saw God. Probably a vision of Yeshua. And his face was covered. No prophet will ever be like Moses. Now, other people say, other people say, do, you have a, do we have a chart up there? We're going to try to end with a chart. The comparison. Yeah, good. We're going to try to end with this. Because a lot of people say, which is very, very interesting, that Moses was very much like Yeshua. The prophet like Moses. And they do this comparison. Look up there while we're looking at it. At their birth, Yeshua and Moses, enemies at their birth. Both. They both had similar enemies that tried to destroy our Jewish people. There was Egypt trying to, to destroy all the Jewish people with Pharaoh. When Yeshua was born, Rome, and they tried to destroy all the Jewish people. A lot of similarities with Yeshua and Moses. The king of Pharaoh said, Jewish people are multiplying too quickly, let's kill all the Jewish babies. Uh, 1,400 years later, what did Herod say? Let's kill all the Jewish babies in this area. Early years of Moses, we know he was in Egypt for 40 years. The early years of Yeshua, his father was warned, don't stay here, Herod's going to kill you. Where did his father take Yeshua? Everyone? Down to Egypt, his early years. Um, called, uh, Moses was called out of Egypt to deliver the Jewish people. Yeshua and his father was called out of Egypt. God made a special call to his father, Joseph. Forty days. Moses was 40 days on the, in Sinai, up on the uh, Sinai. Yeshua was in the wilderness 40 days. A lot of comparisons. It's probably remarkable how many similarities. So I used to think the prophet like Moses was Yeshua because of all these comparisons. Maybe, maybe. But it says, uh, Moses would be called the deliverer. He delivered Israel. Yeshua would deliver not just Israel, but as we're going to see later on, he also delivered Jews and Gentiles. Uh, Moses was rejected the first time. Yeshua comes, he's rejected the first time. Uh, Moses comes the second time, they accept him. Yeshua will come back. On his return, they will accept the Messiah. Moses was a prophet. He spoke for God. Remember, God spoke to Moses. Moses spoke to the people and gave them the law. Yeshua was a prophet. He explained God to the world. Tells us in John chapter 1. Moses was... Mo Remember I told you the difference between a prophet and a priest? There's a few people in history that had the role of prophet, priest, and a king. Moses was one. Moses was a prophet. He was also a priest. He spoke for the people. He was also like a king. There's a few people like that. Samuel was similar. He was a priest, but he was also a prophet. He was the leader of the people. There's a few pictures like that in history. Here it says that uh, Moses would uh, be a priest who would pray for the people. Yeshua is the ultimate prophet, priest, and king. He prayed for the people. Uh, Moses was like a king, like a king. He wasn't a king. They didn't have him yet. He led the people. Yeshua will, is a king, and he will rule the people. Miracles. Moses, it confirmed, the miracles confirmed Moses was God's servant. The miracles confirmed Yeshua is the Messiah. Similar miracles. Moses turned the water to blood. Yeshua turned the water to wine. Similarity. Moses put his hand in his jacket, came out, leper. Put it back in, healed. Yeshua touched them, healed the leprosy. Very similar miracles. The Jewish people had no food. What did Moses do, everyone? Lord, well, Moses didn't. He sent, Lord, send the manna. Yeshua says, I am the manna. Although he gave the manna, to, he gave bread when they had none. He fed them, but he himself is the manna. Miracles, similar. He fed the people just like Moses did. Of course, Yeshua did other miracles aside from that. The blind, the lame, the deaf. Uh, these proved who Yeshua was. Yeshua is a prophet like Moses. Now, I always like the comparison. I like that chart. I do. It really shows that Yeshua was like Moses. But let me tell you, the real way Yeshua was a prophet like Moses that he said in Deuteronomy chapter 8, uh, 34, no one knew 
No prophet has ever known God and seen God face to face. Yeshua, the prophet to come, would see him face to face. No one was like Moses except Yeshua. Yeshua is the promised Messiah. We know a few things about Yeshua. Today, he's from the tribe of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Judah. Second, there will be a prophet like Moses. Father God, we thank you for the word of God. We thank you for all these fun, fun passages that speak about Yeshua. Must have been thrilling on the road to Emmaus to have Yeshua himself speak of himself in the Bible. But Lord, we see that right now as we look through the scriptures. We thank you that you opened up our eyes to show us that Yeshua is the Messiah. Our prayer today is if there's anyone here in our congregation or looking on the screen, live streaming, that you have never accepted Messiah, today would be the day you want to accept Messiah. You realize Yeshua would be born in Bethlehem. He'd be God in the flesh. He'd be born of a virgin. He would come before the destruction of the Jewish temple. He'd be rejected. He would die by crucifixion. We would recognize the pierce marks when he comes back. We realize that Yeshua is from the tribe of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Judah, and he's the prophet like Moses. Lord, you give us proof that Yeshua is the Messiah. If there's anyone here today is convinced, this is what you say. God, I believe Yeshua died for my sin. I believe I'm a sinner. I believe Yeshua died for me. I now want to receive him into my heart and my life. I put my trust in him. Come into my life and save me. So, let's all bow together. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up the light of his countenance upon you and give you his peace. B'shem Yeshua Meshichenu, Baruch Haba, B'shem Adonai, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. In our Messiah Yeshua's name we pray. Amen. Shabbat Shalom.